Right, so um, I thought what we'd have a look at this evening would be fuzzy logic. And I'll explain in just a second what, what that is. <clears throat> uh, it's been around a long time. Actually, I've, I've got a picture of the fellow who invented it uh, in just a moment, uh, 1965. So um, again, with all these things, you know, machine learning and AI, nothing is new. It's all just, a lot of it I find uh, is just old school stuff that's just been given a modern spin or a modern fancy name. That seems to be a, a bit of a theme I've discovered. So anyway, so uh, I, I think these first three points here really just encapsulates what on earth is fuzzy logic. And, and the picture here at the bottom, you know, if we're doing digital electronics or everything just on or off, like a light switch is on or off. That they are your two choices. With fuzzy logic, you've got everything in between. So um, I've got have got a little example of some stuff which I'm doing with machine learning um, just at the end of uh, this this little little slideshow. Um, uh, that's going to be showing exactly what I'm doing with fuzzy logic. <clears throat> so, um, say so I think those three things are probably the main three takeaways. Uh, this is a picture of the chap. Um, he passed away in I read 2017, aged 96. And uh, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this right, but Azerbaijan, which is just north of Iran, is uh, where this chap was. Uh, from so yeah he's uh he's the father of fuzzy logic he's probably receiving some award there i wouldn't be surprised but anyway so what i thought we would do is we'll have a look at some fuzzy logic from an electronics perspective of um you know getting the signals into a raspberry pi pico and then I thought then, you know, we'd have a sort of two minute break just to regather our thoughts and recharge our minds. And then I thought what we'll do is then maybe we'll switch, switch over and maybe look more at the software side of it. And in particular, um, Random Forest, which you may have heard about. So let's let's dig into some electronics uh, just to start with. Um, you know, whilst our brains are fresh, uh, the complicated bit always comes at the beginning. So if we're going to use a Raspberry Pi Pico, which is what we've been discussing for this entire series, we've got three ADC inputs in order for a fuzzy logic input, because it's an analog signal. That's um, so three ADC inputs. So there's not a whole lot. So my thought was, well, look, if we've got more than, say, three or you know, analog signals that we want to do some fuzzy logic on. How could we do it? We've only got three, which isn't really very many. So an easy way that we could do it, actually, just dive straight in with some electronics. And we could just use a Schmidt trigger. So for those who haven't you seen Schmidt triggers before, it's an op-amped um, circuit. And my first top tip, is always pick an op amp that has a rail to rail input and a rail to rail output. Now, what that means is this one here, you can see the power supply is plus 3V3 to minus um, uh, 3.0 volts, could be 3V3, um, whatever your circuit is. And the input can actually drive to the power rail. And so can the output drive for the power rail? Because with a lot of op amps, you won't be able to reach the power rails. So that, that could limit what you can do. The other word to the wise is, of course, as we mentioned before, um, with signals going into the Raspberry Pi Pico, is the input voltage must not be higher than the supply voltage to the chip. Otherwise, you'll find the chip might start to hang on you. So I've learned that one the hard way. <clears throat> so the other thing um, with any op-amp <laughs> design 
is of course uh, going into a pico uh, you don't want to have a negative voltage so in this circuit here um, you can see uh, there's actually a diode CD063 that'll be the footprint and then B03034 uh, R so that that's just there just to make sure you don't go and, and shove a negative voltage into uh, into your circuit because uh, it probably won't do it any good. So anyway, uh, the whole point of an op amp circuit uh, with, with a Schmidt trigger <clears throat> is you can create a threshold at which the logic level is then going to um, trigger. So here I've got V upper and V lower and. Just to make your life easy, on the right hand side, there's a whole bunch of equations. It's extremely easy just to work out, well, what voltage reference do I want? And you could easily rearrange that equation to work out what the resistors are. And this R123 just means the resistors are all in parallel. And, and there's the, the simple equation at the bottom of the page. So the only thing to remember with a circuit like this is <coughs> Uh, you don't might have to have a low voltage like the V lower in order to reset the Schmidt trigger. So if you are going to say need more analog inputs than the three that are available on the chip, you might have to think, well, actually, how am I going to reset this thing? Um, I've got an idea for that in just a moment. But let, let's tickle along. To make your life easy as well, I did a bit of hunting around on the internet and I found um, this hyperphysics um, link here um, where you can just type in what voltages you want and also what resistors are, and then it'll just work out everything for you. So I'm all for the easy life. But if we're going to talk about machine learning, <coughs> what we might want to do is come up with a way to adjust the thresholds because if we're going to be doing some feedback in our machine learning which is the whole point of machine learning so i figured well we discussed it last week last week last month and uh, we discussed that actually you could actually swap those resistors for something like a digipot and you could do exactly so this is the one which we spoke about last month the data sheet for this maximum part is uh, on my download page. And I think it was something like £1.50 each. Uh, super easy to use these. So you could easily just have all these set up uh, you know, as a lookup table and some bit of code. I've written that bit of code, unfortunately. But it wouldn't be hard to swap in some digipots so you can um, uh, set whatever threshold you want. Now, you might think to yourself, well, is there not an easier way to do this? Could I just not use, say, a comparator? Now, the thing with a comparator, unfortunately, is you can see here, whilst that might look like an easy solution, unfortunately, you're probably going to get some jitter. So um, I've kind of overemphasized it here in my drawing. So whilst it might look OK, you know, when you zoom out on your oscilloscope, when you zoom in, you might see you've got a little bit of a problem. Whereas if you use a Schmidt trigger, then uh, that won't happen. Problem solved. So you're saying essentially the Schmidt trigger kind of latches. Yeah, it has to. It needs to drop a certain distance before it resets. <laughs> That's right. Now, if we just go back, we'll just um, emphasize that a little bit. Let's go back to this one here. Yeah, oh, back again, eh? Yeah, so you have two levels with the Schmidt trigger. So, for example, if you, make, if you tied VREF to zero volts, then you could set your Schmidt trigger to say, let's say, minus one volt and plus one volt. You could say, um, lift the VREF to apply one volt, and then you could have your Schmidt trigger set at one volt and a plus or minus, let's say, half a volt to keep the math simple. So it'll, it'll trigger one way, but it won't actually drop the other way until the voltage drops. So there's always that, that, that little grey region. It's called a hysteresis. Yeah. Uh, that's not the only. I've got another solution in just a moment. But this one here is a way to have, you know, a fuzzy logic threshold, whatever you set, 
and then have a digital output. The Schmittrig output could then be go straight into um, one of the digital IO pins on either like a Raspberry Pi, like you know, you know they're the main board, say the three or the four, because uh, they don't have ADC inputs. Um, or of course, you know, you could just um, stick it into one of the Pico inputs; it wouldn't be a problem. But say we don't apply negative volts, so uh, it's just one to be mindful of. Okay, good question. I'm all for questions. If nothing's clear, by all means, you can always stop me. Otherwise, I'll just wrap it on. Right, okay. And uh, yeah, and then the other easy way that you can actually do this is um, just with a NOT gate. Um, I had to check this equation a few times at the bottom because I couldn't believe it was that simple. <laughs> But with most logic gates, if you assume the threshold, certainly if you're using CMOS, the threshold is at half the supply rail. <clears throat> so, um, so it works out that the the and because it's got a um, a logic gate, it's got a very low input current. Pretty much, the current through R one is the same as the current through R two. So it's easy then to work out that current is voltage divided by resistance. So it'll be, if, if at the output you'd have say V, not in fact, I can just turn on my uh, little, little pointer thing here, if this works. There we go, screen pointer, it's laser pointer. That sounds cool, doesn't it? There we go, right. There's a cat dot on your screen. Yeah, so look, so the current through there is the same as the current through that one. So this one's quite easy to work out, but it does have a limitation. <laughs> so if this was say two volts, uh, then the threshold is one volt. You'd have one volt divided by that resistance, and then this would be one volt minus whatever that input there is, and then that would be divided by R two. So it actually works out to be a horribly simple equation but the threshold level you can't change. So that's a downside with this. So this, the threshold level is stuck at half uh, half the supply rail. So it's gonna be say three V three divided by two. And then it'll just be plus or minus that. So you might, and I thought, well, how can you do a reset? So I thought, well, you could actually, whoops, does that work? There we go. So, um, so if you wanted to do a reset on this particular configuration, to because you've got to come up with a way to reset it, I figured well you're probably going to have to have some sort of reset, external reset from the from a GPIO pin. So once you triggered it at whatever level of three point three plus whatever, you'd have to find a way to reset it. And I thought well the only way I could think to reset it is actually to probably put a MOSFET on. I'm not saying that's the best idea in the world, um, but I will say it certainly will work. So um, those are some ideas for um, going digital uh, or the electronic side of it, I should say. Um, I have mentioned this book before. Um, I think this is a pretty good book. Um, it's got it's got a ton of stuff in there. I actually did use this to check my um, op amp circuitry. Um, you need either a very good set of eyes or a magnifying glass to read this book because there's a ton of stuff in there. <laughs> but it, it's all really small print. So, okay. Uh, ex excuse me. Yeah. Um you you mentioned a MOSFET just now. Uh, why a MOSFET specifically, not a bipolar? Okay, very good question. So the reason I tend to go for a MOSFET, uh, you could use a bipolar, of course. Uh, with a bipolar resistor, uh, you would, of course, need a bias resistor in the circuit. Um, you know, where my mouse pointer is right now, you'd have to have a resistor. Uh, you could use, uh, it'd be an NPN type bipolar transistor. Um, yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, my my go to these days tends to be MOSFETs. Uh, if I'm doing logic stuff and they've got very low current drain, 
I don't know how this would perform because if you've got much higher leakage through a bipolar transistor, I don't know whether that would affect the threshold levels. Um, it might be negligible, if I'm honest. Uh, would it work? Yeah, probably. But that's, yeah, so you said, I think you certainly could do. It wouldn't be too hard. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Okay, I like the questions. It means I'm not talking to myself or the internet hasn't hasn't dropped out on me. Um, anyway, yeah, so I think those are the electronic ways. That's quite quick, wasn't it? <laughs> wrote this this afternoon. Uh, right, so um, how are we doing for time? Well, we're doing pretty good. Are there any questions on the electronic side? Anyone want me to go over anything again? Or why I've even done it that way? That's a no. Good. Right. In that case, uh, we're doing all right for time. So, uh, oh, hang on. I have to do it that way. Uh, right. Well, I've got a short two minute break just to allow me to recharge my voice. And uh, if you want to grab a glass of water or something just for a couple of minutes, um, now's kind of your opportunity. So, I'm just going to hit that one. Uh, if you want to during the break, nip off to this website here and grab those downloads. Um, you're very welcome to. You'll see it will say number seven for this little slideshow. And then uh, after this quick commercial break, um, it'll, uh, we'll, we'll dig into the software side of Fuzzy Logic. So um, back soon, as they say. Right. Um, good thing about having a quick break is it gives me a moment just to remember what I've been talking about. And there was something I glossed over, which I'm just going to go back for us. But I think it's worth just doubling back here a second. I've mentioned this before, but it's really good just to remind ourselves that with the Raspberry Pi Pico, when you've got um, the pins because you have to define the which pin you're using if you're using the ADC or even the GPIO just a reminder that you're not referencing the pin on the Pico you're referencing the GPIO number it's a dead easy one to overlook and think right okay so it's on pin I don't know what that is let's say it looks like it might be 10 or so and you think, right, that's on pin 10. Well, actually, it's not pin 10. It's actually GPO 6. 
So just one I've just remembered, which I did gloss over. And uh, just a little reminder that it's, it's such an easy one to get caught out on and think, why isn't anything working? Right, okay, glossed over that bit, but let me, since we are doing all right for time today, which is nice. Right, bear with, where are we? Right, so what I wanted to look at now, that was how to get some of the electronics signals in for fuzzy logic levels. <clears throat> I wanted to dig now a little bit more into the software side of it. And in particular, we'll have a look at something in um, machine learning world, AI world called Random Forest, which you're going to discover very quickly is hugely disappointing. It's not what you think it is. So uh, what I've just got up here on the screen, um, you know, if then else fuzzy logic uh, is nothing new. As I said earlier, you know, it's invented in 1965. But these two pages here is actually on the left is actually a page from my BBC computer manual. And on the right, it's a Sinclair ZX81 manual. And, and you can see, you know, if you want to think about a fuzzy logic perspective, you know, and if then, and well, here's an, an analog number. So that's fuzzy logic, really. You know, and even back in, what's it, 1981, the ZX um, Sinclair ZX1881 came out. And look, then here it is again. So it's nothing new, but as we're about to find out in just a second, um, you know, when we talk about random forests, you know, for machine learning AI, you'd think it is something new. So um, just to burst your bubble there, I suppose. So um, one of my other little pearls of wisdom for this evening for us is, uh, if you meant to join us last time, we, we looked at, um, uh, was it no, the one before, it looked at proximity and what's the, the key I wanted to pull out here for us to look at was when you're using fuzzy logic, it's to make sure that you cover every eventuality from minus infinity all the way up to plus infinity. Uh, if you were to miss anything out, then um, you know you potentially your code might do something you weren't expecting, or you know if you did if you'd done this in like C and compiled it, your code might go off somewhere do something you weren't expecting. So the moral of this story is make sure you you cover every eventuality of what you're expecting, and I also say go beyond what you're expecting. So assume nothing. Um, by way of example, one of the things which we spoke about a few times um, on this show um, is with the Pico, uh, because it's an emulated floating point zero, flo floating arithmetic, I should say, because um, it's an M0 core, M0 plus core, <clears throat> you end up with rounding errors. So you've got to make sure that if you're using fuzzy logic for anything, which I do, and I'll, I'll show you an example in just a moment of what I'm doing with fuzzy logic. Um, you make sure that whilst you cover the events that you know, you need to also make sure you cover all the events that maybe you're not even expecting. So every event that can happen in your fuzzy logic levels is covered with some action. Uh, and that's pretty much what I did here. So that was just, uh, I think, the, the takeaway message there for us. Right, okay. So um, uh, one of the last things I wanted to dig into with fuzzy logic, it's something called random forest. Um, I don't know if anyone's come across this term and term before with uh, AI, but really it's just, as we'll see in a sec, it's just a whole load of if then else computer statements. So like, like here, got our mouse pointer, you know, th this is an if then, uh, you know, if it equals, I know, 
one thing go this way, another go that way, another go that way. So this is what's called, you know, back when I learned the program back in the 80s, we just called this a nested if then else. And that's what random forest is. And you can see there's, there's a load of them. So uh, I've probably uh, ruined that for someone. <clears throat> so by way way of an example here, and uh, trust me, even writing out like this, I really had to stay awake and color code it. But one of the things I think, if you're talking about it from a machine learning perspective, uh, I think it'd be better off having these parameters rather than trying to hard code them like we saw just, I think, on that page just a moment ago, where where we could go back. We've got the time. Yeah, see so here, here it's all hard coded, you know, if legs equals six. Um, I would say probably do more what they've got on the BBC version, which is a, if H equals F times G, and then F times G, you would then put, you will grab that maybe from a table. That way you can update the table, which is what machine learning is all about. So just go back here. So if you were to then drop them all into a table, well, first of all, you could see if you had a pattern in the table, and then you could just update the table if you ever wanted to. So I'm a big fan of just put everything in an array and then reference the array, and then your say your code gets the data from the array, and then you just got to update the array. Otherwise, you're going to be sort of plowing through lines of code, and I, I guarantee it'll be an absolute nightmare. But like I was saying earlier, every event here has to be covered. And I think just by way of example, <clears throat> so there's just the sort of things you could do. So I just, and also you could then see if you had a pattern. And if you're doing machine learning, where, where you are looking, the whole point of machine learning is to look for patterns in data. And I've got an example for you in just a second. Um, you know, you might be able to spot it. Uh, which I'll show you uh, some of the stuff which we're doing in just a moment. So that's random forest. Um, supremely disappointing, isn't it, really? It's just an if-then-else computer statement. And here there's like three trees. I think back in the old days, I'm sure somebody might know better than me, you could have something like 32 nested uh, if-then-else statements in uh, in your BBC program. Uh, I, I was a B-boy, so maybe uh, some new different for Vic 20s or something. Depends how old we are. Anyway, right. So let me just show you an example of where this whole lot can go. This is something which I'm working on at the moment. Uh, I'm doing working on a project which brings all this together for us uh, into wind turbines. So over the last two months, I've been plotting some data. Um, so this is actually data from the brakes, the actual brake data um for a wind turbine in scotland and i've plotted the whole year <clears throat> but i've just grabbed four of them here and uh yeah you can see in february um this is just arbitrary up here you can see in february i had some a little bit of up and down on, on the brakes this is brake brake uh it's got two brakes like on a bicycle you know front and back and uh, what I was looking for is the difference in the pressures on, on the brakes. So you, you can see February is our reference and it's not too bad. In June, it's a little bit more tasty. Um, so I've got some high brake pressures going, different differences going on here. So it's probably binding in the brakes. So yeah, and then I've got some, some in August and then in September, well, the wheels really come off the cart. So these different levels are what I'm going to basically put into my random forest um, equations. <coughs> so be bear that in mind for a second. Um, and the straight line is that is where we've calculated, uh, it's called linear regression. I think we've spoken about that in previous sessions on how to do linear regression. Uh, if you dig back through the slides, uh, of the shows, I should say, you'll find there's one on linear regression. I think it may have been, see, maybe in December, I think, uh, November or December, uh, you'll you'll find this stuff on, if you take lots of data points, how to work out the straight line that goes through them all. But from that data all coming in, 
we then work out a whole load of different things going on. So that great that yellow line is actually what's going on here when we stick them all together. We can see the breaks are something awkward has happened in September. And then we look at a crest factor. A crest factor is when you look at the maximum, say, say it's vibration, in this case it's pressure. You look at the maximum and you look at the average. So we can actually see by a bit of machine learning, we can already start to see, well, actually, look, whilst they had that problem in September, the signs of it were over here way back in June. And then we can look at what's called a probability density function, which is when we're looking at the amplitude. So uh, we're getting some high level amplitudes. This is the green line um, in, well, that's in September. But we've got some low level ones kicking off in June. And we've got another sort of medium level one here, but my pointer is, uh, which is sort of May. So that's all using then in just a moment, we're going to use all these different levels, uh, which is basically one big if then else computer statement. We're going to plumb them <coughs> into each one of these trees. So although I had four, I've just got a picture of three here. So the data from, let's go back, hopefully still with this story. Um, this line here going up and down is what we will feed into this one. And then the crest factor will flow into that one. And then, you know, and, and so on and so on. Uh, I've got four there, we'll do three in this picture here that I've edited. In reality, we use eight. But the beauty is that if you've got a, using, you know, thing, whether we use the ADC pins or whether we decide to use, um, you know, like that, the Schmidt trigger, for example, what we're creating is like a data, a linear data stream to represent what's going on. So just back there. So we can then create using some of our uh, fuzzy, lo fuzzy logic, we can create like a digital image of what's going on winter, whether it's a wind turbine, for example, or whether it's your car or say the battery on your e-bike or whatever, you can create like a digital picture. It's like a string or a vector, if you like, of your application. And I think, you know, the, the Pico will be able to do that for sure, uh, depending on how complicated it gets. But with um, machine learning, what you're doing, you're you're allowing for a degree of uncertainty, so you have to allow for a little a little bit of slop or slack in the data. So you don't want to be, ever be sort of hard and fast with your with the numbers. You wouldn't say right, I'm exactly going to be half a volt. You always want to allow for a little bit of tolerance. So there's a like a, a small degree of doubt, which uh, I think we call it a confidence interval um, in the results. And uh, that would pretty much do it for you. <laughs> Hysteresis. All right, I'll explain that in just a second, Greg. Hysteresis. Right. Uh, okay, look, that's kind of what I put together for us on electronics and the software. It's, um, it's not as scary as everyone makes out when they talk about machine learning. The only thing I would say uh, about it is, of course, how much data you've got. Um, if, you, if we go back a second to um, to, to these, these graphs here, uh, the wind turbine data, they're recording every second. Now, every second, of course, means, um, you know, we've we got uh, 86,400 samples a day, which works out as a quick calculation. Uh, it works out, you've got, uh, well, I think you've got about sort of, uh, about, about over a million samples per month. It's a crazy amount of data. So I think the other thing to do is when you're using like these small microcontrollers, 
is to grab the data in small chunks and try and do some processing and then reduce it to a even smaller number. So for example, if we look at this graph here, um, say one, two, and three, well, that'd be 86,000 samples between those two. And I've managed to boil it down to just one result. Uh, the next day, 86,000. 400 samples, I boiled it down to uh, no results. There's nothing there of, of any value to me. And then I get the numbers I want. So I've boiled this down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, about 13. So yeah, I think I've got between 10 and 20 results per month. And with that, I do some fuzzy logic and work out some, some magic graphs and then pump it through and if then else fuzzy logic, random forestry, and out of it, I can then start to work out, do I have a problem here? Can I can I predict anything? You know, is it gonna rain, for example? In the case of which I'm tinkering with, it's can I predict if the wind turbine is going to break? And uh, I, I think the answer is yes, we can predict it's going to break. Right, hysteresis uh, was one question. I'll come back, to, come back to that, shall I? So that's what I've got to share with you today. Um, let me come back to hysteresis in just a second. I'll switch uh, cameras. Actually, it's OK. I, um, I thought that's what you were getting at. And I was just querying uh, that it was hysteresis you were talking about. Yes, it in is. connection with the script trigger. I know what it is. Oh, OK, right, OK. Right. Um, do we explain for any, anybody else? I'll tell you what, we've got some time. Let me just um, swap cameras because that was that was a show and tell. Um, but you know, we've got we've got a bit of time. So uh, I'll just make a note before I swap this camera to the overhead camera, so I can explain that for anyone else. Fifth um, of April is our, our next jolly outing. Uh, it's British summertime then. Um, clocks change uh, on the twenty sixth of March. And I've got a slight change for next time. So uh, we were going to talk about, about if then else, which we've kind of done really. But over the course of the last year of working with the Raspberry Pi Pico, I've come across a few issues with the I2C and the SPI that kind of aren't documented anywhere. So I thought it'd be well worth us having a session on that. And I can show the gotchas I've come across. So, uh, you know, elephant traps, you can avoid them. But let me unshare that now, and let me just swap cameras. And since, you know, not everyone knows what hysteresis is, uh, let me just share that. So if I stop that, I'm going to start another camera, right? I'm hoping this will work. Uh, right, hang on, my friends. So if I hit that second visualizer, right, I need to move my camera, let me move my bit of paper, right, hang on. Right, okay, I will share. Well, right, hang on, this isn't going very well, is it? Right, let me just close that down. Uh, right, now then, hopefully if I do a share on a whole new page, if I share my, there we go. Right, okay, everybody, there you go. So it's my overhead camera. So hysteresis. So what we'll do is we'll just draw here for us. Right, so uh, I think it'll probably look like this. So I think uh, so we have V, I think this is V in on this axis. Yes, it is. And this is V out. This is for our Schmidt trigger circuit. Now, what you will notice is when we're talking about a Schmidt trigger, something else we mildly glossed over, is it's it's positive feedback. When we're talking about op amps we have negative feedback. So this here, this is a Schmidt trigger 
here. Hope you can see that okay on the camera. Is that coming out okay? Is it a bit light? Let me just move my uh, page across. I might be able to. Okay, we'll leave that. It's working okay. Whereas when you when you've got to do it in red, when, when it's an op amp. Yep. An op amp is negative feedback. Good for amplifying the circuit. So if you're ever slightly unsure as to which one you've got, it's all about the inputs here. So this has got positive feedback. It's going round to the positive, and this is negative feedback. And when we're talking about hysteresis, it's when we get a trigger level here. So we'll go that way. But when they want to sort of send the signal back from say, say this will say, let's say it's 3.3 volts, and this is at zero volts. Now we might then sort of drop that to say, I don't know, let's say it's um, down to, and then let's say it's minus 3.3 .3 volts maybe. And then this will change to one volt. It's not until this goes back up to 3.3 .3, will this then trigger back the other way. So it looks like that. If, when you have a look at the drawings, you'll see you'll get a, a sort of a swing like that. And that's called hysteresis. So hopefully, if anyone wasn't sure, oh, it goes that way, doesn't it? That's what we mean. But yes. Okay, nice question. Is that okay on your cameras? Yes. Yeah, yeah very clear. Hopefully you can see that. Just trying to adjust the camera slightly. Maybe I need a thicker pen. Yes, okay. Uh, any other questions? I was In slightly lost with your not gates. Oh, okay, yes. yes. Okay, let me show you. I'll... Um, I think what you were showing, if I interpreted it right, was that it latches at a threshold, but you have to reset it. Yeah, you do. I so, yeah. OK, so let me show you. So here's a knock gate. You can see that all OK. Right. So. Right. So the threshold for any uh well most and if you took a CMOS of course um, is at half the supply rail so if this was the supply let's say it's v over uh, well we'll call it v naught shall we that's the output there so the threshold is always v naught upon two so r1 r2 so the current through there will be well it'll be half the voltage across that divided by R1, won't it? So that'd be V0 across 2R1. So the threshold with logic gates is always going to be at half the supply rail. Um, but it is a dead easy way to do it. And then this is V in. And so this would be what well, will be V out over 2 minus V in divided by R2, of course. Now we just go a quick bit of multiplication there. Two over two is one. And then that would be, well, that would then be V naught minus two V in over two R. And of course, equals V naught upon two R. Well, that cancels. So it becomes a worryingly simple equation. So it would always be the threshold is always going to be at half of the supply rail. Whereas with that op amp circuit we had, I mean, it is horses for courses at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, so the op amp, you can set the thresholds. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that'd be plus, won't it? Yeah, so uh, make sure I draw this right. Yeah, see, and then, so that was, that was V ref there, and that was V in. The other thing when I when I was working on this um, this afternoon, the other thing to, uh, which I thought about was, well, would you use an inverting um, Schmidt trigger or a non-inverting Schmidt trigger? 
And I think, having a better think about this, I would probably go for an inverting Schmidt trigger for two reasons. Uh, the first reason, of course, is um, you're then only dealing with the input impedance of the op amp, and you're not you're not influencing uh, this resistor here at all. I think that's the R2 and R1. So you're not, you haven't got any influence because if you use a non-inverting Schmidt trigger, uh, which I think looks probably like this. Yes, it does. That's that's a non-inverting Schmidt trigger, and that's an inverting Schmidt trigger. So you, you do have this impedance here met to take into account, depending on what sort of load you had input in here. And of course, it doesn't matter whether it's an inverting one or not, because you can deal with that in the code. You now, because the out the input, you know, as we did that little drawing, looked something like that which meant sort of, you know, the output might look something like that. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's inverting or non-inverting because you can deal with that in the code. So I did have a bit of a think about it this afternoon. So my conclusion was I would stick with an inverting one. I just think it's a less chance of something or compromising or going wrong, you know, with influence these resistors. Just my my thought. So yeah, good questions. <laughs> um, what else can we uh, can we talk talk about? I I, I did the other week. Um, and this is so much concerns me a little bit. I suppose I I picked up this this well, I can show on the camera here. There we go. So I picked up this the other week from Heifers in Town. And I thought, oh, that might be useful. So it's a quick book review, uh, which I'm not not bowled over by, shall we say. So what I noticed is when you start looking, when you look at, we can just open any of these here, it doesn't matter where, where we open it. I've kind of noticed that with a lot of these off-the-shelf you know, books, well, most of them off-the-shelf, of course, um, when they describe machine learning they're always describing all the ones i've picked up so they're all describing everything from the point of here's a library nothing is that i've yet found is probably explaining anything from you know, not necessarily first principles but maybe second principles whereas i'm finding though all these books which i'm having a look at and reviewing they're all very much black boxes you know, and it's all voodoo magic. And when when you when you look at say, you no, know, we've been talking this evening about uh, about fuzzy logic and random forest. And I'm I'm sure in here, I'm just gonna I might prove myself right or wrong. Uh, I think let's look at random forest in here. So when I'm describing random forest, and if then else computer statements, and you know you might have a table. So you're in control of exactly what's going on in that table. And certainly when you're using a microcontroller and you haven't got a lot of memory, I say being in absolute control of it, although it may be a little bit more work, it'll certainly be a lot more enjoyable because you've created it. But you can see a lot more of what's going on and, and control it. Whereas, uh, begins with R, uh, random, doesn't it? Uh, one, two, one, two, seven. Right. So page one, two, seven. And this is typical of what I'm finding. And I'm trying. Random forest. OK, so it's quite nice that it says random forest is an ensemble of decision trees. Uh, if then else computer statements, as we've discovered. Right. So I think brilliant. Right. And then it just it, it it tickles along and and goes straight. Um, I can get this camera working a bit better. Oh, that's that washed it out now. Uh, that might work. Yeah, it, it goes straight into, you know, black magic libraries that they never explain anything in, you know, 
doesn't necessarily have to be first principles because you know I, I do say you know you don't have to worry about exactly where equations come from but it's certainly good to be in control of it but they just never explain anything like that and i'm noticing that a lot in you know machine learning and ai and this book's another prime example in my view so do i think this is a good book to go and buy you know and keep keep in your in your library um i'm gonna say no <laughs> Uh, I might, I might, I might donate this one to the Make Space Library in a few weeks' time. Stephen, I've got a question about the detection of the threshold levels. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a logic level that the digital inputs on the Pico trigger at. Yeah. So why can't we just pass our input signal directly to a digital pin? Oh, you can. Yes. Well, OK, so uh, I few things. Um, one, of course, it will be a fixed level. So if you're using, uh, you know, if you want to do multi level fuzzy logic, yeah. like, like I'm having to, where well, you've only got one level to start with. The other thing I don't know is whether the input is a Schmidt trigger input or whether you'd end up having some of that jitter that, that we described. Oh, uh, right, yeah, the Pico's internal circuitry may... Yeah, so, uh, you know, yeah. maybe if you did a quick search on, on the internet, you, you might you might find that um, uh, it might be Schmidt triggery, but it'll certainly be a fixed level, of course. And uh, I, I, I don't know where that level is. I don't know if it's half the supply rail or whether it's two volts or or not. So, um, yeah, and and how variable is it then per per chip? So, yeah, yeah no, interesting points. That yeah, make, makes yeah, it's you know if you're doing quick dirty things, it's like the same you know about using a if you're using like a um, a comparator, you know you think well what can possibly go wrong there? Well, you, you're going you're going to get some 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 timing issues. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's horses for courses. If you're looking to do something quick and dirty, you know, you know, uh, just to prove a prove an idea, then yeah, why not? You know, wh whatever works. But you know, if you're going to design a circuit, uh, I would be inclined to put a tiny bit more thought into it. I mean, of course, you know, we didn't really talk today about you know using the ADC pins because. And um, they, I think if you look back through um, the proximity, there's quite a lot there. And I think when we've done sound, uh, there's quite a lot in there, some clues on, you know, on the uh, uh, the ADC pins, because uh, it's 32 bits, or is it 16 bits ADC? So, yeah, good, good question. Yeah. So when I'm using... Um analog inputs to measure things like battery voltage i'll often have a resistor ladder to drop the signal voltage to within the range the chip can yeah. handle can you use that for these sort of sensing techniques to yeah threshold level yeah absolutely sure. yeah sure in fact you know um yeah, but for using a battery, I'd probably then use that Schmidt trigger circuit, you know, and set the threshold wherever I wanted it to be. Yeah. So yeah, um, if you're using the only thing I'll say to be careful of with using a a battery and two resistors is you know the 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 real circuit for a resistor but for a battery. Oops. You know, uh, when we, I know when we, we do these sort of things, when we're doing our A levels, you know, a battery really is a battery source and, and, a, and a small resistor. So you are then going through another resistor like that, aren't you? And then you're going into your Pico. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, you know, that's, a, that's R1 and that's R2 and that's V. Put it V in, shall we? So don't forget, you know, you've actually got this combination of R plus R one really in your in your your, uh, your right. Yes, yeah, so that might actually be biasing the result. 
Well, there's two things that will bias it, actually. Um, thinking about it. Yes, you've got this will buy it, bias it, but also there's an internal resistor inside the chip as well. Yeah. So uh, I would probably maybe... I might then think about what well, actually maybe what I really maybe should do is maybe slide it through an op amp first and then go into my my chip so I'm sort of so I've got a more controlled situation that's what I would probably consider consider doing because it's, it's good it's good it's good to be in control that way, whatever that is, it won't then affect any of your measurements. Yeah. And yeah, you still got a resistor here, of course, to think about. But then if you if if that if you're worried that was causing you a problem, well, you know, you could. I mean, we're getting we're, we're getting we're getting a bit more detailed now, aren't we? But you could if you then if you wanted. Oops. These pens, which um Pens that you can rub out, which was a pencil when I was at school, uh, uh, removed by friction. Absolutely yeah, love, that's, love um, them. That's an ink that goes transparent when it gets hot. Yeah, I guess I guess it, it is friction, isn't it? And so it uh, heats up the, the yeah the the eraser on the pen essentially heats up the ink to the threshold where it goes transparent. Yeah, I, I absolutely love them. They're, they're, they're not they're not cheap. They're like four pound each. But if you go to W. H. Smith, however long that shop's got left, um, <laughs> they they got a whole range of colours in there. It's just absolutely brilliant. But yeah, with your battery one, I I would maybe be thinking, um, you know, you could do something with stretching the point, really, aren't we? But you could do something like that. So you could buffer it here. And and then you could buffer here. That 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 way, whatever this internal resistance here is, it won't have any effect on your measuring circuit. Yeah, I mean, there may be applications where measuring the voltage of your source are super critical to sensitivity, and and that that's useful knowledge to have. If you're just trying to work out, do I need to charge my battery? Yeah, then the top circuit is probably more than adequate. Uh, it, yeah, if it's if it's lithium, you know, if it's uh, well, most rechargeable is lithium these days, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, with, with, well, actually, no, I'm going to take that back because I've been doing stuff with batteries. If you look at a lithium circuit, lithium battery, as you as you may know, you know, lithium is great, and then it just falls off a cliff. Yeah. So as soon as it starts to fall, you're pretty much at the point where it's. However. Empty. When that battery gets old, it'll start doing something like that. So, um, do you then? It, it, it's, I, mean, I don't know the answer top of my head, but is this a symptom of a growing internal resistance? R I for R internal. Mm. Could could be could be the trouble is the manufacturers never give you this sort of data. They just give you this data. It's all the manufacturers will ever give you. Uh, you know, they. I mean, I've, I've got this problem with their project at the moment. You know, is, um, I I I think they've got a battery problem. <laughs> yeah, I actually built an automated battery profiling rig to to tell whether the cells I was buying from China were. Cheap rubbish or decent. Well, funnily, funnily enough, the batteries um, on this project I'm working on, um, yeah, how do we call them? Chinese batteries, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm question, I'm questioning the batteries. The other issue, of course, uh, as I've been inspecting these batteries, is they've got like soft spots. I can, I can feel it. Like you know, the areas where the batteries like a tiny bit spongy. Right. You know, and you know, which means then you've clearly got short circuits in the battery, which means then you've got a you know a resistance. You know, you've then got this resistance problem. Yeah, and there's, there's been some problems with charging. And uh, yeah, I mean, I know this charging batteries is quite an art, particularly if you're going to go try and do wireless charging. It's it's really not trivial at all. But then you've got this, and of course, you know, this is day one. This is day three hundred and sixty-five. Yeah. So it's 
it's not easy you know and um it's the one which in my experience seems to get overlooked quite a lot you know everyone thinks oh design some amazing circuit and then goes yeah well you know what about the battery the power management and it's just been given no regard at all i think it's because it's like not sexy and then we like with the wind turbine stuff we've been looking at you know i'm thinking well i think we should be looking at the brakes you know it's, it's got the right amount of fear factor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you know everyone talks about the sexy bit which is like the blades and the generator i guess that's mm. the bit you can see and i'm thinking i think i'm going to look at the brakes you know we, we can see you know it's what we been doing my cat saying hello uh with what we've been doing and what we've spoken about you can clearly see you know from using the fuzzy logic and the random forest stuff you it's so clear that there is absolute brake binding issue in, in yeah. this in this turbine it's as clear as day i did ring that i said no 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 we've got no problems with the brakes i'm thinking that's not what the data says yeah <laughs> you know uh i think always trust the data <laughs> Yeah, there's some great videos of wind turbine failures online where the um, the brakes or the governor failed on them. Oh my God, yeah, I know. And you know, um, I mean, the one which we're working with, luckily, it's only got two brakes, so it's quite easy to do the maths. But some of them, I, I was just reading around, some of them have like twenty brakes on them. So how how we then put twenty breaks through our mass and then our, our random forestry? I'm I'm really not sure how we do that at the moment. Uh, there must be a way to do it, and I, I'm really not sure what it is just yet. I think, geez, how do you do twenty breaks? And then say you've got I know this. Let's say you've got a wind farm with say you know twenty to fifty wind turbines. I think that's a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, but if you've got 20 to 50 wind turbines you could just monitor them all and look for outliers you may not know what's wrong with them but you, you know say, what this one's not behaving like the other 49 we should maybe look into it yeah you know what um i'm just doing a quick bit of maths here yeah so okay bear in mind there you go so they re they record every second that's 2.7 million data points per turbine per or per per parameter per month <laughs> that is a lot of number crunching i mean yeah. i i've had to write a python program which can well it boils it down to 200 it takes every 10th sample it boils it down and i tell you, the computer you know excel was still really struggling you know i kept getting the um not responding coming up whilst it's going ah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan as well of, you know, if you can with all this number crunching stuff of try and distill it down to a manageable level. Yeah. Because the other thing is like, you know, we've got this six years worth of data, which and I'm very grateful for, of course. Um, but, yeah, we've had to do quite a lot of repairs on the data sets, you know, and it's, it's almost like you know, they get the data and they just like put it in a drawer. <laughs> Bit rot. Yeah, pretty much. You know, you know, you get, you know, you get it out. And think, well, I mean, the other thing, I mean, uh, I'm sure I've mentioned before about cables being a nightmare problem in electronics. Uh, mm. I hate, I hate cables. And you can see, like, there's periods where, according to the data, the pitch of the blade was, and I'm not kidding, minus one thousand degrees. Now, I'm pretty sure that's not a thing. <laughs> You know, uh, they don't go beyond 90 degrees anyway. And they certainly don't go minus a thousand, do they? That, that, that can't be right. The only way you can get that problem is you, there must be, and I'm convinced this exists, um, an EMC problem. I know I've banged on about EMC in previous talks. Mm. And it is without any shadow of a doubt, you know, in my mind, in 30 years of doing EMC, <coughs> Absolutely, there's an EMC problem in the turbine with the cable. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Of course, you can then pick all this stuff out and then you, you can bung it through. You know, you can write algorithms. And there are, you know, we're talking about, you know, this book, machine, this machine learning book. 
you know, and you, you look through them all and you will find that, um, you know, oh, yes, yeah, there, there's an algorithm for that already. But you have absolutely no idea how it works. Mm. And what you were describing to me, you know, about the monitoring and picking out outliers, you know, that was my original thought when I started looking at wind turbines and collecting data, you know, actually, you know, using a Pico. My original thought was, well, look, what we'll do is, well, every 20 minutes, we'll wake up, we'll taste the air, if you like, for, you know, say, you know, a few minutes, yeah. you know, to equivalent, say, say 100 revolutions, roughly how long that would take, about seven minutes, I think. And, you know, and then and then we'll do some analysis and then we'll, and then we'll nod off again. You know, and, you know, and then every hour we'll scrape that data and we'll look for the outliers that you described. In reality, uh, having spent the last three months working on these algorithms, uh, I don't believe that would work. Because they also they, they the turbines stop and start quite a lot as well. There, there, mm. There's about I think it's about six reasons. Um, you know, it, it can be broken, of course, uh, and it, and these are all the reasons they they stop. It's not one of them. It's all of the above. Yeah. If it's broken, um, so it's off. So it's dead money. Uh, it's down for maintenance. The grid doesn't want the power. That's another one. Um, so those no are the. Wind. Yeah, no winds, not enough wind. Yeah, just to seven megawatts doesn't mean you're getting seven megawatts wind as well because they have to. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and there's two others I didn't know about. Um, one's called noise curtailment, right? Because uh, if, if it's near a residential area and it's grinding, yeah, and usually that's because there's a brake problem. Mm. You know, when you go and stuff the brakes up, particularly within the cell tower, the big bit at the top, um, if you go and screw up, you know the the, the um the brake shoe the disc yeah uh, you've then got to take the nacelle tower apart right which is really expensive or uh what was the, the other one which we we found there was uh oh god what's the other one there was um noise guitar uh, shadow flicker it's called it is when early in the morning oh, right. when, the, when yeah. the sun's low <laughs> yeah and that blade's going round it's going to cause a shadow flicker on the houses. Yeah. So actually, no. So looking for outliers when you've got all the and of course, you know, the one we're working with the demonstration turbine, so it's on and off all the time. So with all those issues going on, just looking for outliers and off the shelf uh, equations like you know that like like that this this talks about, uh, it just doesn't work. Yeah, you know, you, looking for it. Are they behaving properly? Then you could look for behavior at a particular state. So when it's when it's starting up, or when it's shutting down, um, or when it's running, mm. kind of constant. And then if you can come up with some way of turning that data into a pattern that you can feed into a machine learning, I mean, a bit like image recognition work. So if you could visualize the data in a way that you could then feed to a machine learning algorithm mm -hmm. and you could learn to categorize the data yeah. and you could then say this, this was a turbine that turned out to kind of it, it broke down a week yeah. later whereas these turbines carried on operating fine you may find there's some kind of predictive pattern recognition that could come out of that well, yes, and you know, and um, some years ago, um, there used to be an event in Cambridge called AI Frenzy. And it was it was run by a chap called Wasim Hanif, um, Barclays Bank. You know, it's about every month. It was, it was quite good. I mean, it attracted a lot of students and people who like pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, did my figure of power no good that did um but you know i, I do remember uh, i can't remember the chap's name and i can't remember his company but i remember what he said and it was a throwaway comment which i think are always the best ones they're the ones that are completely unrehearsed and are straight from the heart and he, he, he made a throwaway comments and I thought, and he, I remembered it, and I think he's absolutely spot on right with, with what I'm playing with. What he said, he said, if you wanted to characterize anything, he says, he said, you really need about nine different parameters, and then you can describe just about anything. 
And the stuff which I've been looking at, I think is absolutely spot on right. Mm. And the other thing which I've been really careful of, and you know, I say this to anyone, you know, whatever you're doing you know, with AI at all, is to be very wary of what I call the the pie par chart, pie bar chart syndrome. <laughs> My cats are arguing. And by, by that, what I mean is um, when I've gone through all these different equations like crest factor, and there's one, like, there's one called impulse margin, and I've got there's a whole load of them. But when I've plotted them all, they all pretty much give you exactly the same graph. I thought, you haven't actually learned anything new here. You've just you just got like you just got like a pie chart, bar, pie chart, or you've got a bar graph. You know, it's just a circle or lines. There's no new information. It, mm. uh, and that's one thing that I think, you know, if you're going to do anything with AI uh, or machine learning, which is just maths at the end of the day, I think that's the one to be extremely wary of and uh, and check. And of course, you know, if you're using some, some of these off-the-shelf things. Um, I don't think that none of them take any of that into account. So there, no, that's my pen is worth. <laughs> right, okay. My cats are whinging. They probably want food. That's all they care about is their food. Yeah, food in a warm place. That's what our cats always. Oh, <laughs> that's their two basic needs. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, I, th I think it might be the last month of the radiators. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> I, I, I think the government a is, is it this month or next month that they they're stopping that? Yeah, I think it's it's April, isn't it? Is it April? So mm. one one more one more month of um, warm radiators, and it's going to be sort of and jumpers. sunny window sills will be their only hope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you ever think you've got like a, a warm leak somewhere, just send the cat in. <laughs> Anyway, right, so uh, the 5th of April is, I think, our next outing, and uh, I, I have actually changed already what we're going to talk about, because, uh, yeah, I, I think we'll we'll dive into half we'll spend on I2C and half we'll spend on SPI, because uh, I have come across a few gotchas with the Raspberry Pi, and, uh, yeah, if you're, not, if you're not aware of them, it, it's very easy to step on the, slip on the banana skin and go, what is going on? So uh, I think we'll look at that next time. All righty, um, there's only three of us left. Greg's been very quiet. That's okay, uh, deliberately muted. Oh, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, I think it's time to go put the kettle on and I will look forward to seeing you next time. Yeah, uh, thank you, Stephen, again. Thank you thank too. And I will you, see Stephen. you all soon. Bye for now. Yeah, next month, cheerio. Yeah. Bye.